where we're going to discuss today uh, multi-MC and the EUICC and uh, why it's important to leverage both as part of an EUICC um, strategy. Uh, so with me today on the webinar, uh, I have uh, both uh, Jean-Philippe Betoin, um, so uh, from Keegan, and uh, we have uh, Curtis um, Govan, who is uh, currently trying to connect. Uh, he's had some technical issues, but um, uh, Asaf, his colleague, has uh, kindly agreed to step in while Curtis is trying to resolve those issues. So, um, Jean-Philippe, um, maybe I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself very quickly, please, to get started. Yeah, so I'm Jean-Philippe Betoin. I'm working uh, as uh, head of ecosystem development in uh, in Kigen, where I'm in charge of uh, of developing the relationship with partner and uh, the strategic roadmap. Uh, I'm based in the south of France, and I have a, a background in cybersecurity, in different verticals like uh, payment, identity, connectivity. I've been working for uh, some industry leaders uh, in the past uh, thirty years in that uh, in that security industry. Thank you, uh, Jean-Philippe and uh, Asaf. I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Asaf Gigi. I'm uh, leading the marketing activities at uh, Flow Live. I've been with the company for almost six, seven years and uh, currently taking over from Curtis. Uh, hopefully, he will be able to join us. Um, if he will be, then we'll switch over. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Asaf. Uh, we appreciate you stepping in at the last minute. And my name is Paul Bradley. So I, I lead the uh, strategy and innovation um, subject at, uh, at Keegan, uh, also based in the south of France. And um, I'm looking forward to a very exciting uh, conversation with uh, with Jean-Philippe and, um, and Curtis and uh, and Asaf uh, on this, this subject, which is very dear to our hearts. Um, yeah, both at Keegan and at Flow Live. So I'm going to start by uh, asking Asaf to tell us a little bit about uh, about Flow Live. Thanks, Paul. So uh, a few facts about Flow Live. Uh, Flow Live is a UK company, uh, now with around 160 employees, uh, with regional offices in the three main continents: Europe and, and APAC. Uh, mainly to provide the uh, support and services to our customer, to our global customers in their regions, in their languages. Um, we have built, well, we operate um, globally, as I said, with uh, already over 20 integrations with uh, mobile operators globally. And we're uh, backed up by some world leading tier one venture capitals, um, Qualcomm, Dell, 83 North and Saban Ventures. Uh, before we continue, I think that uh, Curtis is here and able to join. So if that is the case, Curtis, you can take over. Yes. I'm sure, sure. Yeah, I think you, you've you uh, hit the highlights there. Uh, the other thing I would add here is that what we do as we kind of uh, shift into the next slide is we have uh, a fully virtualized core network that supports uh, 2G all the way up to 5G. Uh, and then we also have a um, connected management platform that we provide uh, and then a, connect, uh, a customized SIM uh, that we're going to talk a little bit more about today. And uh, rounding out our solution suite is uh, our uh, enterprise grade BSS solution there. So we package all of that together uh, with the mobile operator relationships that Asaf noted to earlier. And we use that to provide uh, what we call the hyper local uh, global connectivity. Uh, what that means uh, to us is that we take all of those network operator uh, relationships and then we're able to provide with a single SIM uh, in virtually every country in the world, uh, more than one network operator for that country. Uh, then in addition to that, we do other things like you can see to the far right there, uh, we add things like satellite solution there so that you're even covered uh, more extensively around the world where the operators have coverage gaps. Uh, with the release 17 in able to support uh, connectivity uh, via that mechanism. So uh, that's a, that's a brief of what we do from a connectivity perspective. Of course, we do a lot of other things with our solutions like mobile private networks and selling our connectivity platform as a standalone solution there. Uh, but I think for the context of today, 
the global connectivity is the key piece that we're focusing on, along with our SIM technology. Thanks, Curtis. And uh, would you like uh, to briefly introduce yourself as well? Because, uh, yeah, just uh, th uh, thank you for, for, for managing to connect. Yes, thank you. And uh, my apologies for the delays. You never know what you're going to get when uh, you're, you're jumping on for something new but old. Uh, we've used them in the past and, and just uh, haven't used it as much lately. But uh, yes, welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today. My name is Curtis Govan. I'm president of Americas for Flow Live. Uh, I've been with this company for a little over three years now. And prior to this, I was with uh, Cisco Jasper for about 12 years. Uh, so a lot of time in the IoT space there, uh, a lot of great lessons learned there. Um, and I think we're at an uh, extremely exciting time for IoT. We're seeing uh, very close to the massive growth that has been promised for uh, a few decades now. And uh, it's an exciting time to be there. I think we have some great uh, solutions that we're bringing to the market uh, with partners like Keegan. So looking forward to the conversation today. Great, and uh, maybe JP, you would like to say a few words about Keegan? Yeah, so on Keegan's side, uh, we have been incubated by ARM, the semiconductor company from uh, 2017 and spun off uh, two years ago in 2021. Uh, now we have been uh, integrated in the, the SoftBank uh, Vision funds. Um, ARM has incubated Keegan with the, the core mission to uh, secure connected devices. And our first focus was... Uh, on bringing innovations to IoT with regard to uh, getting better security, better connectivity uh, with scalability in mind. So that was our three core pillars, uh, innovating on security, connectivity, and uh, making all that scalable. Um, like for live, we are a 160 people team. Uh, we have a worldwide span. We cover three continents uh, with people all over the world. Uh, since inception, before uh, being acquired by uh, uh, um, by ARM, we have been uh, independent for, for five years. And since then, uh, nearly 10 years ago now, a little bit more, uh, we have enabled more than 2 billion uh, SIM and eSIM. I guess now we should be closer to the, the 3 million mark. Um, and we are working with uh, a little bit more than 20 licenses and manufacturing partners all over the world. And we're also a recognized uh, leader in the eSIM segment by, by main analysts. Um, so having been in ARM, we have this uh, ARM DNA, uh, which brings us two advantage uh, on, this, uh, on this IoT market. The first one is we are very close to chip makers and device vendors. Uh, so we look first at, uh, let's say, the, the hardware part and how to embed uh, connectivity and security in chips and devices. And as a result, we are now integrated in eight of the top 10 uh, chipset and module vendors for, for IoT. And the second advantage is we are managing our market as an ecosystem. So we are bridging uh, the what we call the CSPs, the IoT, MVNO, and MNO, uh, the connectivity uh, service providers, uh, with the device maker, the service providers, uh, with also on the, the connectivity side, uh, a focus on IoT uh, connectivity providers like, uh, uh, like Flowlife. And last but not least, uh, we are operating strictly under the GSMA rules. So interoperability is super important for a business and we are following the, the GSMA standards, um, but also we have various accreditation from, uh, from GSMA that I will explain uh, later on. We can go to the next one, Paul. So, um, yeah, so uh, as I've said, we, we have been created to uh, to drive innovation in, in SIM and, uh, and eSIM based solution. Um, so we, we are providing uh, a variety of eSIM solutions uh, and we are bringing innovation in that, uh, in that space. So we have what we call the RSP, uh, the Remote uh, SIM Provisioning Management Platform, uh, operating under the GSMA rules. Uh, we have various security and privacy certification from, from GSMA. Uh, we are SAS up uh, for, for our data generation and secure personalization uh, services. Uh, we are ESA, which is the security scheme of uh, GSMA for, uh, for eSIM security, eSIM operating system and eSIM devices. And we are SAS SM to run securely the the, the RSP uh, solutions on our, on our side. 
Uh, we're also operating in uh, Europe. In um, Our data center is in Dublin. And as such, we are strictly following the privacy rules of, of GDPR. And then on, on those, uh, those solutions, we have uh, started implementing innovations. The first one, as you know, is in the integrated uh, EYCC, uh, which is uh, a, a software UICC, which is securely integrated in what we call secure enclave in, uh, in devices. And we are the, the world leaders with this innovation that we have started with Vodafone and, uh, and Sony uh, Morata a few years ago. Uh, and now we are developing this uh, integrated EUICC innovations for very constrained devices, starting with utilities and trackers and all uh, battery operated devices uh, in the LP1 ecosystem. But we have also developed other innovation like IoT Safe, which is to bring the, the very strongly secure, uh, secure element to do the eSIM. So we piggyback uh, secure element features to, to eSIM, and we are developing that for different uh, MNOs to, to give better security to the devices. And we have also developed what uh, we used to call LED binding, but now which is called uh, in-factory provisioning, which is to, uh, to support uh, device uh, manufacturer or module vendors uh, to inject uh, uh, profiles, MNO profiles and credential at the, directly at the factory stage. Uh, you will see in this presentation, we will say either EUICC or eSIM. So eSIM, embedded SIM, uh, is the more marketing or commercial name of the technology, and EUICC uh, is more the, the technical name that is being used by uh, a GSMA uh, uh, or HC or in different specification. Okay, thank you, JP. So um, uh, let us get started with the the, the, the content, and, and so I'm looking forward to hearing all about um, your your views on on multi MC and how it how it brings a lot of uh, benefits to um, to the EUICC ecosystem. And um, I would ask the uh, the participants if you've got any questions as the speakers are are talking, feel free to put them into the Q and A box, uh, and we'll have a Q and A session at the end. So uh, please uh, over to uh, to Jean Philippe and Curtis. Thank you. Okay, uh, and maybe if we we kind of start with you know, framing up the, the problem that we're trying to address. Uh, if you look at you know why you have the need for multi network, right? So multi MC basically comes from the need to have multiple networks. EUIC from the same uh, requirements there. Uh, if you look, uh, you know the fundamental that you have is that there's no a uh, single carrier in a single country that has 100% coverage. Uh, so at the very least, if you only have a uh, wide single country deployment, you have a need for multiple networks. Uh, this is a reality. Uh, if you look at what we're seeing more now is that you have companies that have operations in multiple countries. Uh, so with operations in multiple countries, you absolutely need to have uh, multiple networks there. Uh, and then you have uh, the need for uh, failover mechanisms uh, for critical applications, or just in general, if you have a need to track a device and uh, there's a network outage uh, from the MNO, there's uh, maintenance, anything that's happening, you need a, a failover mechanism for that. Uh, the other thing that comes into play is just the flexibility uh, to be able to move to another operator uh, for whatever reason, whether there's a commercial reason uh, or a technical reason, something's getting sunset, you need a little bit longer lifespan uh, for a device out in the field for that, or uh, like I said, anything that uh, may come along with uh, particular cost controls. Uh, if you, next slide, please. Um, so if you look at how this problem has traditionally been addressed, uh, the first thing you would do is that you would have uh, relationships with multiple operators directly as an enterprise, uh, as an MVNO, you would have those direct relationships, you would get multiple local SIMs. Uh, and as you can see, this comes with uh, a number of challenges there. Uh, the first thing that you have is that uh, from an end user perspective, we look to the left that the end user ultimately wants a single pane of glass across all of their deployments there. Uh, to achieve that in the old method, then you had integration overhead because you had to do uh, basically bespoke integrations with every MNO 
that you were working with. Um, the other piece there that comes into play is the partial coverage. As I mentioned earlier, no one has 100% uh, coverage uh, there. Uh, then you also have separate billing mechanisms. Uh, you are typically locked into an individual operator for uh, not only locked in uh, for just that individual SIM, but you probably have some commercial commitments to that operator uh, to get their services there. Um, the thing that is uh, probably the biggest pain there is now you have uh, multiple SKUs for SIMs, so you have to be very careful in managing those SKUs. You end up with uh, too many of one, not enough of the other, and then you've got to manage all of the logistics of getting uh, individual schools in, uh, SKUs in and managing those SKUs as you're distributing to your end customer there. Uh, from a service perspective, it, it, it really, we, we say here, it's maybe a pretty strong word to say it's subpar service, but if you look at overall what you're getting from a service perspective there, it lacks uh, uh, what the expectations are. Uh, par being what the customer is needing, uh, not necessarily what's available, but what the end customer is needing, you tend to fall below what your, your expectations are uh, as an end customer there. Uh, and then control and visibility are some of the legacy things that have not been for all of the platforms universally across the operators that an individual enterprise or an MVNO would need to manage their business. You simply didn't have all of that available there. Uh, and then of course, the if you didn't uh, properly do all of the integrations, you might have the swivel chair solution where you just simply had to, uh, not instead of having a single pane of glass uh, view, you had to swivel chair and, and log into multiple systems to manage your overall business. Uh, so that's with local SIMs. If we flip to the next slide, uh, the advanced solution was that, okay, we can get better with this uh, with roaming. Uh, so you can see certainly roaming um, made some improvements there, uh, but yet it still uh, has some of the, some challenges there. Uh, in particular, there are some countries as, as we all know that have uh, permanent roaming restriction. So you simply can't roam in those locations. So you still end up with uh, a bespoke solution where you're having to do local agreement and adding SKUs for that. Uh, the service piece again uh, comes into play there. Uh, and then the other piece when you're roaming, now you have data that is typically going outside of a local country and you end up with uh, uh, data privacy issues, which we've seen over the last uh, decade have become more of a concern now we have regulatory uh, compliance issues like GDPR that we need to be uh, adhering to. So that, that poses a, a challenge there. You still end up because you have a SIM uh, with an operator lock-in in that case. Uh, and then uh, performance uh, when it comes to latency uh, becomes a problem there, uh, particularly for LPWA uh, devices that are uh, battery sensitive uh, in particular having that additional latency uh, impacts your battery life. So you end up with uh, a little bit more challenges there. So um, as we go to the next slide, uh, awesome improvement uh, from a technology perspective. Um, oh, I think we skipped the slide here, or did we? Oh, no, 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 oh, no, no. Uh, this is uh, the, the uh, multi-MZ piece comes in place now where now we're trying to solve all of the, all of the problems up above, and uh, we're able to provide uh, still a very highly secure uh, solution that's lower cost, uh, and that it delivers all of the functionality that you need um, to solve the problems that we talked about before, uh, with the additional benefits of being able to do one single integration uh, with a, a network. So you simply get your single pane, pane of glass, one integration, one API, uh, one um, MO or one agreement to assign, one bill that you get from that. Um, you also have the added piece there because the network in this case is what we provide and all of our integrations are exactly the same around the world. So you get that consistency of service uh, and expectation from the network controls, the deep insights that you get from having access uh, to the network information is very beneficial to operating the business efficiently, uh, whether that's making improvements or quickly assessing problems. All of that comes into play with the multi-MZ piece where the network integration is in, in place. Uh, and then of course, like the, the main thing there, if you look to the left, is the fact that 
you really do have that true single pane of glass uh, from the connectivity management platform. Uh, so that's a multi-MZ piece there. And I think our next slide, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, EUICC. Uh, JP, I, I think this is over to you. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. So yeah, um, the, the EUICC or ECM, it's, uh, it's a GM, SMA standard that has been created uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, for uh, the automotive industry, you know, in automotive, uh, now you have some regulations that uh, ask mandate to have the, the automotive, the car connected to the network for, for security reasons. So that's uh, started like this by uh, big car companies pushing that at GSMA uh, to have uh, a flexible solutions that will act as a, a kind of uh, uh, a container uh, with multiple uh, connectivity profiles from different MNOs. So you have different kinds of, uh, of slots in that container. The first one is the bootstrap. So the bootstrap is the one that you always use at starts um, and it allows you to manage only one single SKU. Uh, and this bootstrap is supposed to connect in all your uh, target regions or countries or even all, of, all over the world for, for some of them. So that, that uh, the bootstrap allows to implement the single SKU promise. Um, then we can have multiple operational profiles. So for example, you can uh, build your device in, uh, in, uh, in the UK and uh, your device is going to be operated in the US. And when it reaches the US, uh, the system of FlowLive is going to trigger a download of uh, a profile from a, a US uh, a MNO. So that's what we call operational profile after the bootstrapping. And then you have some profiles concept that are being used either for quality of service, uh, for example, the fallback profile, or for the maintenance of your device and that's test profile. So you have all that set of profile that, that are hosted in the same uh, embedded SIM, uh, which has enough memory to store uh, sometimes up to 10 or 12 uh, profiles, depending on your use case. And on top of that, we have what we call the remote uh, SIM provisioning system or RSP, uh, which allows to uh, securely over the air control the, the different profiles to delete some, to download new ones, uh, to swap from one profile to the other, from the bootstrap to the, the multiple uh, operating profile. So that's twofold. You have the eSIM on the field, uh, which is uh, soldered usually or could be removable in the device. And you have the RSP in the back end. And in that context, the Keygen RSP is connected to the uh, the, the platform of, uh, of FlowLive. And all that is highly secure. Um, it's uh, what we call the GSMA trust chain that GSMA has defined security end-to-end -end from uh, the, the, the eSIM, the, the eSIM device up to the RSP and all the process to manage that. So thanks to that, you can reach this uh, single SKU promise, thanks to the bootstrap. You have no vendor lock-in because you can uh, download uh, multiple operational profile. And we'll come back to that. You can uh, cover what we call RGO or R geographies, uh, which are the ones uh, that are evilly regulated. Uh, next one. So um, eSIM now have reached a tipping point. So you've seen uh, in the US some uh, large tier one uh, smartphone vendors have mandated eSIM only in their devices, but also in the M2M IoT segment. Now it's widely used in automotive. 80% uh, of cars are now connected due, due to local regulations uh, and all those cars are connected via eSIM. Um, and more recently, two, three years ago, uh, utility smart meters have adopted eSIM also for regulation issues. Uh, and automotive and utilities now are, let's say two thirds of the, the users of uh, eSIM worldwide. So eSIM enjoyed a, a two-digit growth in 2022. Uh, the same is expected in 2023. We see the same, the same trends. Um, the number of uh, RSP implementation at connectivity provider have grown by 29, 30% last year. And we see again the same trend this year. According to the, the Trusted Co uh, Connectivity Alliance, the EC market last year was around 400 million units. Uh, which means that we have passed the 20% attach rate of eSIM in uh, both consumer and, and IoT uh, devices. And the usage is growing. Last year, more than 100 million profiles, operational profiles have been downloaded uh, from networks to the, to the eSIM. 
Next one. So we, we mentioned RGOs or R geography, and, and that's one of the the um, the high usage of of ECM. So you've seen the in the world now the geopolitics are, are more and more complicated. Uh, some markets are closing, or um, I mean they are less open. Uh, they have EV regulation like non permanent roaming or data sovereignty. Uh, some MNOs are mandating only eSIM and are not ready to do MC sponsorship for multi MC. So um, one of the benefits of the, the RSP mechanism, the easy mechanism, is that you can reach those countries with complex regulation that we call RGOs uh, that are implementing either non-permanent roaming, which means that after uh, three months of roaming in the country, uh, your device has to swap to a local profile um, or data sovereignty for, for some more complicated country where you have to operate locally. Um, so. Some MNOs, as we say, are also only allowing access to their profiles through eSIM. For example, we have seen that in the US recently, and we have a growing number of MNO now that are restricting the usage of their uh, credential or their subscription to, to eSIM. Uh, and uh, Kigan has, has connected uh, its RSP uh, to uh, all the big uh, our geographies uh, or, or uh, uh, MNOs in the world, uh, allowing customers to get uh, local profiles on their eSIM in those countries. So here you can see uh, Europe. Europe is uh, enforcing more and more uh, non-permanent uh, roaming. So we are connected to different MNOs in Europe. We are getting connected to all the free MNOs in the US, and the US is uh, more and more also enforcing non-permanent roaming. In Japan, we are connected to SoftBank. Uh, for China, we are connected to China Mobile International. And we're also connected to uh, uh, smaller countries, but that have enforced heavily uh, non-permanent roaming, like Australia with Telstra, uh, Canada with Telus, and uh, uh, and Brazil with, with America Mobile. Um, we are also now implementing a, a world first in terms of RGO with, uh, with FlowLive, uh, which is going to be announced soon. So stay tuned, that will be uh, that should be by a matter of weeks. Next. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so now, now uh, maybe switching to the, uh, the overall offering here for multi-MZ. Um, as we mentioned earlier before, this is uh, it really is the combination of all of the MNO relationships here, the core network integration there uh, to create really the hyperlocal network where when you have the need for multi-network, whether it's in a local uh, country or it's a global piece, now we have the multi mz solution that allows that to come into place. Uh, I will just point out just a brief a bit about what, what that solution is. If you look at the SIM picture to the right, uh, where it has the uh, ability to put multiple MZ profiles, uh, MZs, I should say, not profiles, or we'll get confused with the EUICC. Uh, and then there's an applet that has all the orchestration that you can do within the SIM, in the field, uh, where you can take advantage of where you have the most information, which is actually in the field at the edge where the device is. Uh, so all of the MZs, uh, as we mentioned earlier, they're integrated the same way. So they behave the same way, same network uh, integration that you have. Uh, this gives you the full transparency and control as you look into all of the services you're providing. You can see exactly what's happening in real time from the network logs that we provide. Uh, and then the ability for us to customize uh, the solution is in place because we own the core network piece there. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you, this has been something that's been extremely valuable for uh, customers that are latency sensitive for um, voice over IP solutions, uh, even uh, streaming solutions where they're, they're using services like we're, we're using today, Zoom, to be able to customize it within the network for that particular customer and that piece. That comes into play when you own the network component there. Uh, and then I would say, you know, from an industry perspective, what we provide from a 24 uh, by 7, 365 support is best in class in the industry that we cover the world. Our support team has uh, high level expertise and not only tele telecom in general, uh, but specifically for IoT. So we're able to speak to uh, customers, uh, we speak IoT, uh, I would say. 
and it really allows us to provide an extremely high level of uh, support for customers there. Uh, and then, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the all of the features that we come in that come into play here uh, that solve the problem of multi MG, all of the challenges that we mentioned earlier for multi network are solved with the multi MG solution here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, uh, what, what does this look like in the back end? Uh, so JP mentioned that you, you have the RSP uh, from the EUICC perspective. What does that look like uh, from the uh, multi-MC? A lot of the similarities there in terms of being able to uh, provide a standard UICC uh, configuration here. You see here we have SIM configuration and a lot of parameters in the back end that we're able to manage and customize in the back. So you have the applet from the device perspective that communicates to this back-end um, multi-MZ RSP, if you will. And then you also have all of the network logs that are also being fed into this solution. So in the back-end, we're able to do a lot of orchestration, but we're able to set up the profiles here, uh, configure them with a number of parameters, whether that's uh, PLMN uh, preferences, rat type preferences, forbidden PLMNs, all of that can be orchestrated uh, through this uh, uh, backend infrastructure here. And uh, this is how we would set up a standard UICC SIM and also be able to manage EUICC uh, with that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, you'll see here just like the overall dashboard that we get for management and control. Obviously, we have a lot of events. Uh, that are happening in this particular instance here. You see a number of SIMs and subscribers that we have uh, for this instance, the different keys that we have provisioned for all of the SIMs. You'll note here that we have more keys than we do subscribers. That's because of the multi-MZP. So on average, we see anywhere between three and four. Oh, sorry. All coming in, my apologies. Um, we, on average, we see three, uh, three MZs per device uh, that are getting used, and we also often are able to uh, automatically download uh, additional MZs. If you go to the next slide, uh, what you'll see here is just how do we do that, right? So um, the orchestration of what to get on the SIM and when to get it, this all also is uh, able to happen from the backend solution. Also, let's say we're in uh, one of the... Uh, uh, restricted countries, and we get uh, a registration there because our SIMs uh, even are, are able to roam into those areas. But when we get that notification there, we can have a campaign already set up to automatically download the right profile, uh, whether it's an EUICC profile, uh, where this orchestration happens with the Keygen RSP, or we can do it directly from our multi MZ application here. Uh, where the multi mz part of our profile gets updated versus the full EUICC profile. Uh, so a lot of power in, in being able to do that on first registration uh, or just simply knowing where a set of SIMs are going. You can pre-set up uh, a campaign. And of course, the campaign gives you all of the success uh, information there. If there are failures, you get notes on what, uh, what exactly has failed. So you can have retry mechanisms built in as well. Uh, so a lot of power and the ability to not just have it avail available and do an individual change. Uh, this allows you to do bulk changes and manage that efficiently. Okay. Great. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the best of both worlds is now the combination of uh, EUICC with multi MZ. Uh, which we're extremely excited about. One, because we know it's what customers need. We need it as a fact for one of the countries that we're going to introduce uh, very shortly, as JP alluded to. Uh, it's absolutely mandatory. And it brings in uh, a lot of uh, solutions and a lot of flexibility to customers that uh, we've heard demand from uh, overall. Uh, so within uh, the SIM, basically, as you see to the far left, you have the combination of a, a profile from FlowLive that is both EUICC profile and a multi-MZ profile. 
So all of the functionality that we have with multi as an e, as a UICC, we can now put that into an EUICC and still have all of the bells and whistles, the ability to change the MZs within that profile. But when we need to now, now we're able to orchestrate the download of additional profiles. And that is both, uh, I should note, for both for end-to-end -end and for consumer devices, uh, which we're seeing more and more consumer uh, devices using our system for travel applications, uh, for uh, voice over IP, the replacement of push to talk solutions are using the consumer uh, EUICC versus the M2M. Uh, so you know, we're excited to, to uh, bring this to the market here. Uh, like we've said, it's been based on the requirements for, from customers, it's been in demand, and now we're able to deliver this uh, solution with Keegan to the, to the market. Yes, yeah, so in that uh, in that setup, uh, as uh, Curtis said, we we are combining the best of two worlds. Uh, so the the best in class uh, multi MC application from uh, from FlowLive and the RSP and eSIM from from Kigan. So that's fully GSMS standard. So we we are following the GSMS standard called AGP02, which is uh, also RSP and eSIM for for M two M. Um, it's also uh, following the the, the IS security. Uh, certification of GSMA, of course, in the device and in the way we manage the RSP. You have all the benefits of, uh, of eSIM, so the single SKU. So we have this very powerful bootstrap that combines uh, with the multi-application of uh, uh, the multi mc application of FlowLive. Uh, no vendor lock-in uh, because you can uh, download uh, new profiles. Uh, and it's totally following and integrated into the the single pane of glass mechanism of uh, of flow life, um, and uh, the the RSP set, which is what we call the SMSR SMDP. I'm not going to enter the details. I invite you to read the the specification called AGP01, which is the architecture specification for RSP M2M at GSMA that you can download freely from their uh, from their websites. Uh, but the RSP of Kigen is integrated in the connectivity management platform and the single pan of glass of, uh, of FlowLive. And we have also added the uh, SMDP+, and I will tell you why in the next uh, slide, uh, to cover uh, more uh, use cases like IoT consumer use cases, uh, and also to be uh, evolution ready as the, the, the GSMA uh, is also evolving their standards to, uh, to, new, to new architecture. So we are already integrated on uh, FlowLife side uh, with uh, 15 MNOs globally. And on Kigan side, uh, you've seen the list of RGOs that I've shown you. So two globally, 10 MNOs globally uh, covering eight RGOographies. Next. So um, three years ago, uh, we started discussing at GSMA uh, a new evolution of the specification. Um, that was enabling uh, the uh, to solve different uh, different issues or to go to new markets. So the first one was uh, the LP1 market. You know, LTM, uh, NB-IoT, they are super constrained devices, usually battery operated. They don't use SMS. So um, the mandate here was to update the specification and uh, the eSIM and RSP set to address these new segments. And to be battery savvy, uh, to be SMS less, um, maybe sometimes you use co-op UDP or DTLS instead of TLS. So you have a new set of protocols that you have to to embed uh, in the in the uh, RSP. Um, the IoT consumer segment, you have some devices like the wearables. Uh, you don't really know if they are M2M or consumer, uh, or it, it's even true for laptops. They are in both segments. So uh, laptop vendors and other uh, IoT consumer makers uh, wanted also to have uh, uh, an easier way to, to address those, uh, those set of devices that were in between uh, M2M and consumer. Uh, it was also allowing the convergence of, of consumer RSP and M2M RSP. Consumer RSP is the one which is being used by smartphone. M2M RSP uh, is the one that we have described today during the, the, the webinar. And uh, we have made also a different uh, simplification in the way we integrate the, the whole system uh, with third parties, uh, uh, MNOs, for example. 
So at the end of the day, uh, this new uh, standard uh, has been published one month ago. It was uh, it was already in May this year. It's called the AGP32, and that's the 1.0 release, um, which is uh, building upon the existing uh, consumer eSIM specification. So it extends the, the, the existing AGP22 certification, uh, and it's, it's reusing some part of that or add, adds new elements. Uh, for example, we reuse exactly the DP plus uh, as it is being used in the in the consumer, and that's why also uh, we have extended the RSP solution of Flow Live uh, with the Kigan DP plus to be ready to address those new segments and these new standards. Um, there is a new form of a remote manager system called the EIM, the ECM IoT Remote Manager System, um, that is going to integrate. Uh, in the uh, CMP and single pan of glass uh, platform of Flow Live, in, it allows you to uh, um, to remote control and manage uh, your fleet of of eSIM. Um, and there is the so-called APA, the IoT Profile Assistant, which is a piece of middleware that will reside either in the device or the module or the eSIM, um, which is highly optimized and which is going to help running uh, the IoT device uh, and the, the different uh, um, um, profiles that, that are stored in the in the eSIM in liaison with the, the EIM and the, and the DP+. So you can find this specification again from, uh, from the GSMA website. It's called AGP32. It's the first release. It's going to probably evolve to a so-called maintenance release, a 1.1 by end of the year. Um, but now we've seen also uh, customers that adopt both uh, flavors of the, 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 the system, the AGP02, so the, the M2M RSP, uh, with a migration path to the AGP32, which is the IoT RSP. Thank you. Uh, thank you, JP, and thank you, Curtis, for the, um, the great um, introduction to, to all of that. So um, now we have time for a few questions. So thank you to everybody who's already posted their questions. And if there's any more, please feel free to, um, to put them into the, uh, the relevant box. Um, so one for you to start with, JP. Can you please explain again the distinction uh, between an eSIM as embedded versus electronic? Uh, so what is meant by electronic here? Yeah, embedded or electronic. I, I think it was the... the, the, the it's e embedded, yeah. E is e embedded, yeah. Uh, yeah. Globally, by embedded, they, um, they meant uh, soldered in the system, but you, you can have both uh, uh, removable eSIM or really soldered eSIM, but it's, uh, it's embedded, not electronic. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's a, but it's it's more or less a two interchangeable terms. You mentioned earlier on, I think that eSIM was a marketing term, right? And then UICC was more technical under term. DGSMA term. Okay, um, next one I think is for you, Curtis. Um, which operator tie up do you have in India? Um, we can uh, connect here, but we we actually have uh, with in India we have access to uh, three major carriers there. Uh, I'll say two of which that are that are launch and one that is on the way. Uh, but happy to follow up offline on on the details on that. Okay, so reach out to Curtis, um, whoever asked that question. Um, then the next one is um, uh, which operator do you offer in a dual profile uh, setup? Where and where is the platform hosted for for this? So, uh, I, I assume dual profile means multi MC, right? Uh, in this case. Yes, yes. Um, so, so we have a uh, platform is on uh, right now physically in, in Sofia, Bulgaria, uh, but we also are, are moving it to AWS, uh, I believe, finishing up at the end of next month. Okay, great. And then um, in multi-MC, uh, what's the maximum MC support? So I guess how many MCs can you, can you have in your multi-MC application if you want to maintain it over the air? Yeah, we don't have uh, a limitation other than the memory on, on the SIM. Uh, right now, we have 10 slots available for multi -MT. Um, Honestly, we've not seen anyone that needed uh, more than that. We have a really nice demo uh, where we have all the slides uh, occupied, but uh, in general, uh, customers need two to three uh, MZs there with the flexibility of being able to download. When you can download it remotely, uh, you know, you have connectivity. So basically, you have at least a couple of MCs that allow you to connect anywhere. 
And then if you're in a location where you need to download something for better performance, uh, better commercials, whatever, we can remotely do that. Okay, great. And I think there was another question about multi-MC and EUICC, whether they're multi mutually exclusive. Um, so I, I think you've you've quite clearly uh, said that better together um, in, in the webinar. I think that was one of my key takeaways. But um, maybe um, you could clarify another question of the same vein, where you'd use a multi-MC rather than an eSIM or, or when you need to do maybe an OTA update through the multi-MC versus uh, using the eSIM capability. So maybe maybe JP, do you want to take that one or, or Curtis? I think that that's um, that really depends the, the local regulation. In some countries, you can do that. With some MNOs, you can't do that. Um, so And that's why it's more flexible to have both because there are things that are easier to um, to manage via multi-MC, uh, assuming you have the agreement with the MNO to do uh, MC sponsorship. Uh, but you have some uh, some markets uh, or some MNOs where you can do that, so you need to go through, uh, through eSIM. So uh, that, that would be my, my answer. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, so uh, then uh, an interesting one, and I, I like this question, are operators willing to provide profiles for EUICC SIMs? And what's your experience there? How, how easy is it to approach a big operator to ask for their profile? Um, yeah, for, for EUICC, I think it's it's the standard. The operators have adopted it uh, there. There's a little bit of a gray area within most operators when it comes to consumer and IoT versions there um, you know that's typically two different business units that have it so if you have um, as an example a laptop and you want uh, you're working with the iot team but you need a consumer eSIM, there there's uh sometimes a problem with that but generally operators are very open uh to the euicc and offering that as a solution there it's been very well adopted uh you may have noted uh we had our ceo near shalom had a um a presentation that he did uh, about uh, a year ago uh, regarding the ESIM and uh, the growing popularity of that, given the uh, movement by micro, uh, Apple to move strictly to that uh, form factor for all of their new devices. So we're seeing a very wide adoption of uh, EUICC and getting profiles from operators. Uh, on the MC side of it, uh, multi-MC where we're doing the integration, uh, this is one that, that we're growing. I mean, we have a, uh, a number of operators that we're integrated with now. We mentioned we have 20 uh, and, you know, we're rapidly adding that. So we're seeing more and more that operators are open to this method uh, because what we do is uh, the fundamental piece there is that we want autonomy to operate our business and our customers to operate their business. When we own the network infrastructure there, uh, with the MZ hosted on our infrastructure, it gives us that ability, which reduces their operational costs um, from a perspective of now the core network is ours, but also we're not having to call them for every single issue that happens with the SIM because we don't have visibility. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Curtis. A very comprehensive answer. Um, so um, then uh, another question on the EU ICC platform. So where is that hosted? So I guess the um, the yeah for for managing the uh, the eSIM capabilities. And uh, can you please elaborate a bit more on the functionalities available in the OTA platform? And for Curtis, me or. Yeah, you can, uh, JP, maybe you take the EU ICC and uh, uh, Curtis, maybe on the OTA, just if you want so to. The, the EU ICC platform or RSP is hosted in uh, in Dublin, in a secure data center, uh, which has been uh, certified by by GSMA. That's called SAS SM. And, um, and we're also uh, strictly following the, the European uh, privacy GDPR rules. So it's hosted in Dublin, that's the answer. Okay, great. Um, and Curtis, on the on the OTA features? Yeah, the OTA, basically anything on the SIM, uh, we can update uh, via OTA. So there's a lot of functionality there, too much to go into detail here. Again, happy to set up a session and give an overview of what we do there. But you, know, you think about all of the parameters that you would put on the SIM to optimize the connectivity, we can OTA that. Uh, now, of course, we need to have the, the, the SIM connected to do that. Uh, so we try to go out the door with the best solution out the door. 
and we have a lot of flexibility in in terms of configuring uh, parameters on the sim to allow that first connection, if you will, and that connection anywhere in the world to optimize that. But once we have connection to it, uh, we can OTA basically any parameter that we have on the sim, including the full profile um, of that MZ and all of the associated parameters, the PLMN, FPLMN, uh, equivalent HPLMN, all of those parameters can be created. Great. We have three minutes left. We can try and squeeze in a few more questions. Um, one from Catherine. Uh, what is the main interest to mix EUICC and multi MC techno? Uh, because both provide the same services. And yeah, of course, EUICC implies all SMSOR and SMDP interconnects, which is costly. So what's the main interest to mix EUICC and multi MC? Yeah, I'll, I'll say you, you almost answered that question yourself. Uh, yeah, exactly. Component. That's what I thought as well when I was reading it. <laughs> the, the cost component comes into yeah. play uh, when you look at uh, really low usage devices that are, you know, maybe they're using less than a meg a month, two meg. The, uh, the need to change and download profiles there uh, becomes uh, cost uh, uh, preventative there, if you will. And so that's generally the solution there. The other piece there is that, look, uh, EUICC adding that um, gives you also another lock-in that you're not ha you don't have even with me. So if you have an EUICC profile combined with my multi-MZ and you decide you don't want to do business with me, I'm working hard to keep business, but if, if a customer wants to leave, they're able to add that. Or if they want to bring their own connectivity because they uh, got a tremendous deal with the local carrier and they want to do that, EUICC, that combination allows them to do that. So it's a lot of flexibility that the end customer gets there, assuming all of the commercials are aligned. Okay. And I think also, as we, we've said previously, uh, some MNOs, some countries, and some industries are mandating uh, EUICC. For example, for car, for utilities, you have to use EUICC, and that's growing. So uh, yeah, you should, sometimes you just can't use multi MC, and that's why it's uh, it's nice to combine both. Okay, a question from Sylvie: Is there a limit on the number of profiles for each sim? Does it's memory right? of the the size of the of the e sim? So in the the current setup we have with uh, with Flow Live, I think we have uh, six to eight or something like that that could be downloaded. It depends also the size of, uh, of a profile. So if you go to LP1, you will have 20 kilobyte profiles. Uh, if you go to 5G, you will have 100 kilobyte profiles. So it depends uh, in which industry and on which uh, bearer you are going to to operate your, uh, your eSIM. Okay, um, there's another question. Hang on, let me see, we have one minute left. Um, I'll try and pick a short one. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, are there any? Um, uh, let me see. Da, 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 da. Um, doesn't um, multi MC increase the cost if you're paying to reserve a profile you're not using? It it, it could. It could possibly increase the cost depending on how many profiles uh, you have there. Now, uh, in our business, we don't charge for uh, MZs that are not using, used, so that, that wouldn't add the cost monthly, uh, but there may be a one-time cost there. Uh, but I will say the ability to download the MZs uh, also uh, is the way to prevent having that added cost up front, right? No need to go out with a bunch of MZs on a SIM that you will never use. We want to go out with the absolute best one. Okay, great. Okay, uh, one, one very quick last one. Uh, maybe it's for Curtis, um, because they're asking what differentiates you from the big players, and they they have Talos and, and GND marked. So I guess it's a, it's a, it's a. They're referring to Keegan here. Uh, what what do you think it is, Curtis? Uh, what differentiates us yeah. or Keegan? Yeah, Ke Keegan from Talos and GND. I guess they're asking. Uh, um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll ask you because you're you you maybe have have a different uh, different opinion or. Yeah, look, I, I'll say for our, uh, from our perspective, we really value partnerships. Uh, and when we say partnerships, that means that we're both bringing something to the table and we're both equally working hard to make each other successful. Uh, exactly. We found that in a partner at Keegan, uh, JP has, uh, I'll say, been tremendous to work with. Uh, when we need him, he's available. Um, look, that's a, the technology is super solid. Um, which we expect from a com company of, of the brand of Keegan. But the partnership piece there and the relationship piece there is even more critical. 
Uh, so right. that's it. Okay, thanks, Curtis. And um, we're getting a few questions on the, the features of your CMP platform. Um, I don't know whether the attendees, I, I think it's maybe a long answer to, to go into the, the thing, but maybe in a nutshell, uh, Curtis, what, is your, what are your key differentiators versus uh, other CMPs out there? Yeah, um, real time. Yeah. Everything that we have is real time. It's all running through our core network. So that's a key component that we have. So we have real time visibility and control. That's the number one thing that you'll see that's different from us than uh, other platforms. Uh, but I know we're going to answer all of the questions offline. Uh, again, my contact information will be available. Happy to have a, a meeting with anyone who wants uh, wants to talk. Okay, great. Well, I think all that's left then uh, is to let everyone know that yeah, the, the recording will be available as will the slides, I believe. Um, you know, a massive thank you to everybody, firstly, for listening and for the great questions that we received. And uh, last but not least, to JP and to Curtis for sharing the insights about MultiMC and uh, the uh, the path, indeed, that we have to um, to get to uh, an EU ICC by levering the, leveraging this uh, this great MultiMC technology on, on the way. So, um, yeah, a big thank you to everybody. And, um, yeah, uh, the recording will be available shortly to uh, listen back or, or look at any of the points again. And we'll try to get through the rest of the questions uh, offline. Thanks, Paul, for your moderation. Yeah, thank you. Take Hello care. everybody. All the best. Bye. All the best.